So the thing I wanted to cover a little bit of some some things that are going on uh, as it relates to diseases and insects in, uh, in the environment we're dealing with right now. Um, it is, especially in the eastern uh, Corn Belt and east, it's been much wetter and cooler than normal. So there are some diseases in wheat that we're concerned about. And also in the south, there is a, an insect in uh, grain sorghum that is uh, beginning to become an issue. We want to make sure we have a discussion about that and, and how uh, some products from 360 can uh, help mitigate those issues. I'm going to start off with a couple of fairly common diseases here in the Midwest, at least, and, and even out west as well. And that's um, powdery mildew and head scab. Um, we have had really good conditions for the development of both of those diseases. I'll start with head scab. Many of you know this, that head scab is caused by the same organism that causes that pink stalk rot in corn, it's gibberella. Um, the, the disease is referred to as Fusarium germinium, but gibberella stalk rot is very common and uh, that's the same organism. Like um, gibberella, if you, if you know, there's also an ear rot phase to gibberella in corn, and that infection occurs during flowering. It gets on the silks and infects the ears. Well, similar in wheat, that those infections will occur during flowering in wheat. The, the infections are favored by rainy, which we've certainly had, and warm, humid weather. So um, we've had we've had some decent conditions. I know as we move further south, um, a lot of that wheat is moving into that peaks 10.5.1, which is right at that head exertion. So just make sure you are monitoring and and, um, and we'll talk about a little bit about how to treat in those areas. The, the disease itself, head scab, <clears throat> if you get infection on the head itself, it will produce a mycotoxin called Don. That's a shortened name of it, and that is uh, that's a bad dude. So you do not want to uh, do not want to get that head scab and have that infection in your wheat. <clears throat> We're going to post this um, this deck, but there are two really good links that we'll have in there. One is a predictive model, and I, I listed it up here that helps you kind of predict based on weather conditions where head scab outbreaks might occur. And then there's also a place where you can sign up if you'd like a text alert. Uh, a push notification that you may have conditions favorable for the development of the disease in your area. Again, we'll post this up on our website so you, you can go and, and access both of these links and sign up for those alerts if you wish. Powdery mildew, similar in that um, it likes these wet conditions, although the difference is uh, powdery mildew tends to favor cooler uh, temperatures like that 50 to 70 degree. Um, but I will say there can be overlap in that 70 to 75 degree range as far as development of both diseases. Powdery mildew tends to develop, to develop where um, you have real, real growthy wheat that you, you know you've applied a lot of nitrogen. You've got real dense stands, um, don't have a lot of wind movement. You can get um, powdery mildew development during that time. Um, the one thing I would tell you is we really need to make sure that we protect the fat flag leaf from the top part of the canopy. That's the factory that really fills that grain, um, and do not wait to treat it tillering. Uh, I, I, let me rephrase that. Do not treat it tillering, wait to treat. Um, and the, the benefit of that is when you treat at that later stage, you can actually get both head scab and powdery mildew. So how do we treat them? Um, really, again, the best time is within a few days for head scab, we'll start there with, within a few, few days of head emergence. And, and by the way, I, I put this link up there as we talk about feeks growth stages. This will be in the deck as well. If you're not exactly sure how to stage wheat, now, I know many of you don't necessarily have, we've grown some of you have customers that do, but it's a great opportunity to go to this. This is a good publication to help you learn how to stage wheat. Um, make sure you understand that um, head scab treatment is a toughie. There aren't a lot of good products out there. Um, in fact, uh, control is not really a, a word we use as it relates to head scab. Suppression is probably a better word. Uh, BASF Corumba is, is one product that has suppression on head scab. It's a good product. It's probably one of the better ones out there. So the other thing is when we think about treatment head scab, and you'll hear me say this a lot as it relates to wheat diseases and even the sorghum issue we're going to talk about is that coverage is critical. And I'll show you some slides here in a little bit of uh, the approved coverage that we get with 360 undercover when we run that right through the top of the canopy. As far as powdery mildew, um, there, there are good varietal resistance um, mechanisms out there. So, you know, you can buy a variety that has good resistance. That's great. Um, 
the thing I would tell you is you may be tempted. You'll see that uh, the powdery mildew start developing down in the lower part of the canopy, and you'll be tempted to um, treat it too early. But again, keep in mind that if you wait until that big's 10.5, again, you can go to that weak staging thing, which is right getting close to head exertion there, heading coming out. That's a good time to treat, and you can use Corumba uh, because Corumba actually will, will do great on powdery mildew. So just waiting, it'll, it'll save a trip over the field. And again, if you'll take that uh, 360 under cover and drag it right above the canopy, um, you will get improved coverage on the front and back of the heads and also get really good um, coverage down in the lower part of the um, canopy. And again, make sure with powdery mildew, you'll hear me say this a lot, protect that flag leaf. Another disease I, I want to touch on real quick as it relates to, um, we've actually got three more. But this one just popped up, and um, BASF was uh, gracious enough to let me use a couple of their slides. That's stripe rust. Um, rust, typically, they don't survive here in the Midwest. They come to us up on, on wind currents from the south. And sure enough, I'll show you a slide here in a minute that uh, documents that quite well. Um, the, the stripe rust, um, um, as, it, as you see that picture over there on the right, the, the stripe rust postulates, They'll tear open the, the leaves and they'll call, cause desiccation and even eventual leaf death. So it's a it's a bad boy. They are pretty um, um, pretty heavy when they get with that rust postulate. When they get going, it is a uh, you'll see it's it's pretty dramatic on the leaf. Here's what um, here's what I wanted to show you. This is a wind map from April 27th. We talk about the, the rust that overwinters in the south in mild conditions. This is a great map to demonstrate that. You can see the wind patterns and, and then all those little red dots document where stripe rust has uh, so far, and this, this map's a few days old, but it just documents how that rust came up from the, the south on a storm front, and um, it continues to uh, be more of an issue this year right now out in the west. Uh, you heard me say it before, I'll say it again. This has been a, a slide from BASF. Coverage is critical, um, a very fine or fine medium droplet size is really what uh, was recommended to help improve the coverage, to help control um, uh, many of these diseases. Um, last couple I want to talk about are uh, Septoria and Staginospora. I stole these pictures straight from Ohio State Extension publication. That is Septoria. That's actually very common here um, in, in parts of the Midwest. And then Staginospora on the right. Um, they, uh, this, let me just slip to this next slide. Again, septoria is favored by cool wet conditions. The difference is you'll see the septoria start down in the canopy on the lower leaves first. Um, the spread, it, it's favored by these cooler temperatures again, but it, the spread will slow as temperatures increase above that 75, 80 degree mark. So typically we'll see septoria a little more commonly through May. And then once the temperatures get out of May and they start really warming up, the, the, um, the spread will slow. But I will tell you that uh, as septoria gets going, it can lead to some significant yield reductions. Staginospora, you'll have a leaf blotch, but uh, also the gloom blotch, it can get on the gloom and can cause seed quality issues. Um, so there's, there's and grain issues. So it, it's a little more, um, it, it's a little different from septoria in that you'll typically see it on the top of the plant where septoria, you see it down in the canopy. Um, and the infections will traditionally begin within two or three weeks ahead of emergence. Again, favored by wet, windy weather. Um, but if it dries off, that will slow uh, the development of the disease as well. But again, these two are not uncommon in, in wheat fields. So just jumping on uh, to a different topic around wheat and wheat treatment. Last year, uh, Josh Messer, the RAM in the Dakotas, did a study uh, where they took water sensitive paper and they taped it to heads and then taped it on lower tillers as well. And they compared a twin cap system, which is very common out there, over the top versus a uh, 360 undercover. And what they did was they actually just drug the undercover right through the top of the plant, kind of displacing the head as they spray. And what I want to show you is some of the results from that water sensitive paper. So the flag leaf, you've heard me talk about the importance of covering the flag leaf. That's the factory that fills that grain head. On the left, if you look, there's undercover and then um, the twin cap system. Uh, again, if you think about that schematic I showed you from BASF, you'll want that one on the left. It's really important. Then the other interesting thing, I think, is you look at the picture on the right, the main stem heads. Both of them did a, a pretty decent job 
on the front, but as you look at the back of the head, the coverage was uh, really much improved with the undercover. So we think there's a, a real benefit, um, especially if you think about head scab or, or stagging spore at wound blotch, getting some of that coverage on the front and back of the head is really important. Talk about septoria, and, and we mentioned that that tends to start down the lower canopy, and if you think about some of these lower tillers, um, it's just interesting to know that uh, the 360 undercover on the left, the coverage in those um, lower tillers was much better than with the twin cap system they used. I'm going to jump over to sugarcane aphid and grain sorghum right now. This is uh, beginning to emerge as a, a topic of great interest in the uh, southern U.S. where they are growing grain sorghum. We had a mild winter um, in many areas, and the, the sugarcane aphid um, has begun to uh, build its populations up. This really, the sugarcane aphid um, was not that common in grain sorghum until I think it was about 2013. They started to discover it as moving over into grain sorghum. Uh, there's really a couple reasons for the growth of this um, this pest in grain sorghum. Number one, as it's increased, there are there are very few natural predators. What you'll what you'll see is as as a new insect builds up in its populations, it takes a while for the predator population to build up to help control it. There's a lag time. Sometimes that lag time is a few months. Sometimes it's a few years, depending on the predator. But whether it's parasitic wasp or fungi, fungus or something like that. Um, there's a lag time in the build up of natural predators, and that's kind of where we're at with, with sugarcane aphids right now. The other thing is, um, it's a very high reproductive rate. They can, their populations can explode very, very quickly. So the damage is, that as, as it is with most aphids, they have a piercing sucking mouth part. They can really suck out plant juice. Um, they can cause a lot of grain set problems in the head. Um, the other thing, uh, so a lot of we really cut back on yield. I'll show you some pictures. But the other interesting thing is, aphids secrete a honeydew, and there is a there's a saprophytic um, mold that will grow on that honeydew, and that it gets so thick and so black, it will actually interfere with photosynthesis on the leaf. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. But um, not only does it interfere that that mold, that sooty mold that grows on the honeydew causing interference with photosynthesis, but it can create harvest problems. It's that, it's that thick, it's that dis, um, disruptive. Um, again, in this uh, publication, or I'm sorry, in this um, deck, we'll, we'll, we'll post this up. Here's a couple publications that are just excellent resources for you to utilize uh, should you have more questions, but there's a lot more detail in, uh, in both of those publications. If you look on the, on the picture on the left, um, you can see the difference where you don't do something about the sugarcane aphid. Um, it, is a, it is a big problem. On the right, this is that mold growth I was talking about. The, again, the, the aphids secrete um, this honeydew and then this mold grows on it. And it, it, it can cover the leaves such that it really does interfere with, uh, with photosynthesis. A few tips as it relates to the sugarcane aphid in the south. Scout frequently, um, these populations can explode very, very quickly. Uh, make sure you understand your treatment options. Some of the products you're probably used to uh, commonly using to control insects are not as effective as others. And sometimes in some areas and some states, you may actually need um, exemptions to use products. So make sure you uh, know what you're doing. Make sure you're, you're uh, using label products. Continue to scout up the harvest. Um, that honeydew uh, is, it, again, as we mentioned, it can really be a problem at uh, harvest. And can cause a lot of issues. So don't give up on it once you're treated. And probably the most important tip I would say is that coverage is, is really the key to control. Um, the populations tend to start building up on the underneath side of the leaf, and it's really important to get thorough coverage on top and bottom of the leaf in order to help uh, control and, and knock the population down. You can go through and you can spray, and if you're only getting coverage on the top, uh, again, we mentioned how quickly the population can be, build up. Um, it could be just, um, I won't say a wasted trip, but you won't be as effective in that trip if you're not getting good coverage on the top and bottom of the leaf. I wanted to share with you a couple of photos. Maybe some of you have seen them before. But what we did, we sprayed with the plane, and then we sprayed with undercover and corn. And, and I think it's still illustrative for what we're trying to de demonstrate here. On the left is the top of leaf seven with an undercover. And on the right is the top of a plane with on leaf seven 
So you can see the coverage there, still still decent. But here's the key, if we're thinking about controlling the sugarcane aphid, and we mentioned that the population build up on the other side of the leaf, and how important it is to get coverage there. Um, on the left is the bottom side of leaf number seven with undercover, and on the right is the bottom of leaf seven with the plane. So you'll see if we think about how to control them, we think that undercover will really give us um, that, that additional coverage to help knock those populations down. So I'm going I'm to leave it there. Make sure you go and reference some of these university publications. Make sure that you uh, go to links, sign up for some of those alerts for weed diseases. I guess here's what I would share as I wrap this up. 360 Undercover is a great tool as we start thinking about getting underneath into these canopies to control some of these insects and diseases. Coverage on front and back, and it's a fantastic tool to help your growers uh, increase their profitability. Now, one of the questions I get a lot, and I'm actually going to invite Jim Hedges <clears throat> in to join us right now, because um, Jim and I are having a conversation about this very topic, and, and, I, and I get this question, is, hey, I'd really not prefer to uh, spray with 60-foot boom when I could go with a 120-foot boom. So I, I get I get that, you know, it's a good tool and all that stuff, but man, I'd really rather go 120-foot than 60-foot. Jim, um, in your opinion, if you, you farm, you spray, What's uh, what's your response to that question? Uh, thanks, Jim. And and I, it's a valid question. I fully understand somebody wanting to get efficiency. Um, my response is, am I wanting to get efficiency, uh, or am I wanting to get an effective job done when I spray? So think about sugarcane aphid. If I can use a 120 foot boom, yeah, I'm going to get more done. But at the end of the day, I've got to get it done so I decimate that population and I, I preserve my yield. So for me, it's about um, how effective can I be? I'd rather get 500 acres a day um, versus 700 acres a day and not have to come back and spray another time or two because I've decimated that population. So for me, um, effectiveness and efficiency have to be looked at on how much control do I get? How much yield impact do I have? And do I save myself another trip over the field plus another application of insecticide or um, could be the same thing with fungicide when we think about um, leaf diseases in corn like gray leaf spot or uh, the leaf diseases in soybeans. Um, the other thing that, that we have to think about is uh, exactly what Jim talked about is uh, we have to get to the other side of those leaves or we're really going to be ineffective. And when I think about many, many insects, so the, the aphid, sugar cane aphids, an example, corn leaf aphid, um, soybean aphids, spider mites, where do they live? They live on the bottom side of the leaf. So we're not going to get effective control top down. Uh, the same with fungicide. We're just not going to get into the canopy where yield is determined. So for me, it's all about driving yield. Um, you know, at our last event, Greg talked about it's time to get back to farming, and that's the way I look at it. It's uh, every acre I get over, I have to do it in the most efficient way, but I also have to do it in a way that's going to be the most effective so I get the best return on investment for my trip over and my insecticide fungicide I use. So fully understand the, uh, the objection, but when you really think about what we're trying to get done, by far the most effective and efficient way to do it is with new technology like undercover from an application standpoint. Uh, Jim, that's that's basically how I, I think about it as a farmer myself and also how I answer that question when I get it asked as well. Excellent, very good. Are there any questions, Caitlin? Uh, anything in there in the, in the queue that need to be addressed for anybody? Um, nope, it doesn't look like it. Okay, very good. Jim uh, Hedges, anything you'd like to share as we wrap up the call here this morning? Uh, the, the only thing I would add, Jim, is, I mean, you did a great job talking about um, some wheat diseases as well as, uh, you know, the sugar cane aphid. But, what, you know, where I'm at, there's very little wheat and there's very little, um, well, there's no sorghum. But, man, there's a lot of soybeans. So, uh, as you're listening to this, think about what type of challenges you're going to have coming up in the year. I know that 
where there's soybeans planted um, right now and this weather, of course, uh, they're not really up that much, but you know, white mold could be a huge issue. Um, and so, some models and weather are saying that it's gonna be hot and dry. Um, hot and dry typically correlates to heavy spider mite populations. So I would just be thinking about what kind of challenges could you and uh, your customers be facing this summer and how you can start to position undercover as the um, chosen method to, to deal with those challenges. I, I just, from using it on my own farm, it's incredible the coverage you get in the canopy, whether it's corn or soybean, other crops like wheat um, and sorghum. But I would just be thinking ahead because proactively thinking about it is going to position you to be able to help those growers uh, not only meet those challenges, but uh, keep the uh, the largest level of potential yield that there is out in that field. That's that's what I've got for you, Jim. Thanks. All right, very good. Well, uh, we'll wrap it up. I'll say this. Um, here where I live, north of uh, Indianapolis, I think in the last, uh, goodness, my rain gauge in the last 10 days, I've collected over three inches of rain. Um, keep it going for those who have nitrogen down or put nitrogen on the fall. Um, uh, this is not a good thing. So this is a great time to provide the service to go out to your customers, to have your soil scan machine. Let's go measure and figure out how we can uh, help guys by building a base plus system and then coming back and um, applying what the crop needs, when it needs it, uh, where it wants it. So with that, if there aren't any questions, oh, hang on, we do have a question for Stacy. Caitlin, take it away or Stacy. Okay, the question is, if I hear this right, um, someone's asking if we have tile water testing available. And we do. There is a tab um, in the analyze event or in the mix cycle that says that you can test for tile water on that. It is a beta test, um, but it is available on the soil scan version of news. Stacy, do they need special tools or, or um, any kind of special solutions or anything like that to do those tests? We do. There is an ISA solution that is involved with that too. So if you just order that from our dealer store, that would be helpful with it. All right. Very good. Any other questions? Nothing there. Okay. Well, fantastic. Everybody, um, have a uh, have a safe time. Be um, be careful as you're out there. Uh, one thing I'll just finally I'll wrap it up by sharing with you. I know here in the east again we're behind on planting, but I would tell you um, there are a whole lot of yield limiting factors besides planting date. I've seen many years where some of the later planted corn is the best there is. So plenty of time, uh, plenty of opportunity to still get a, a great crop going. Just need for it to dry up, and we will we'll have yeah. that window hopefully. Yeah. Then hold on, one more question. Yeah. Uh, we have a question. How do we get on? How do we get a customer on to the uh, custom application map that's on the website. So that tool is working out really well. We're getting a lot of pull off that. Um, if you have a customer that needs to be put on there, just send an email to info at, oh, excuse me, news at uh, 360 Yield Center with the uh, business name. Um, if they're doing both wide drop and soil scan or, or either of those, um, and then any contact information, and we'll get those put up there. So, John, that's news at 360yieldcenter.com? Correct. All right. Any other questions? Yes, there is. Does undercover work very well in 15-inch rows versus 30-inch rows for soybeans? Jim uh, Hedges, did you have any experience running it in your your narrow row with last year? You'd be a great person to share with us about that, your experiences. Sure, Jim. Uh, yeah, I ran it in 20 inch rows. Um, and what we did was we just dropped the wide drop base off and ran undercover only. Um, and it did an excellent job. I've also heard uh, we have a, a dealer up in uh, northern Illinois, Jay Springer who actually ran it in grilled soybeans uh, and got a really nice response on white mold. So uh, I believe that we can go through 15 inch rows uh, and get great coverage and even down to uh, 
to drill rows. So I don't think row width is going to be a restriction. So on the on the drill row, Jim, did they just basically like we talked about with wheat, just kind of drag the undercover through over the top of the beans, kind of displace them and as it moved along? Is that what they did? Yeah, that's exactly what they did. So the, just think about the undercover body and dropping it just into the top canopy, about as deep as the body of the undercover goes. And the unique shape uh, of the undercover, I mean, it's designed to basically act like an iceberg. It pushes that canopy wide open, and the nozzles are designed to take advantage of that canopy flow being open so that we get that painting effect with those side nozzles. And then we can push back into the open canopy um, with that middle nozzle. So uh, it's not, you don't have to drop it down to the bottom of the canopy by any means. Uh, when I run in soybeans, I usually drop it down about two thirds or about one third to a half of the canopy. But in a drilled environment, you would not drop it down quite that much. All right. Excellent.